in the yellow, so if you give that card to Louise, I would appreciate it. And a bill, are you about ready? Uh, yes. W-B-A-E-L-K. He's going to talk about, it's a small world after all. <laughs> the master of miniaturization. A guy that's probably thrown more balloons in the air than all of us put together at one time or another. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to mention to the Weather Service people, thank you for a fascinating presentation. I've actually chased the early ones, that VIP model. Uh, they were a nice, like six tones, and uh, that's how they measured it. And they had a 10 foot dish in a radio, which you still have that radio, and a big dish antenna that made a lot of noise, and it would track the signal for peak signal, and that's how they got their azimuth and elevation, and they knew the altitude from uh, the pressure. There was no GPS on them. And so we had to track them down on, with a little, I made a little quaggy with little elements about that long out of a piece of wood, and we would track those down and recover quite a few of them just by direction finding techniques. And then they went to digital, and I haven't chased them more, more recently, but uh, I want to try and uh, track down some of the newer ones. Uh, but we had a lot of fun uh, tracking down those old ones. And if you've ever gone to Wendy's restaurant, and you listen to the sound that the fries make when they're done, it's the exact same tone. <laughs> it sounds identical to the, the telemetry tones from a, a BIZ. Wendy's uh, hasn't ever finished cooking their fresh fries. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> Not the one by his house. <laughs> well, I want to talk about uh, my latest venture in um, micro miniature. I call we call them pico balloons. Uh, launched large stuff like 400 pound rockets from a 300 thousand cubic foot balloon taking 33 tanks of helium so I decided to go to the other extreme and uh, we're going to do something called pico balloons so next slide pico balloons is a real challenge because even though it uses one cubic foot of helium or hydrogen you can actually now miniaturize electronics and tracking equipment with the GPS that weighs under a half an ounce and that's complete with solar panels and transmitter and GPS all on one board that weighs a half an ounce. Now with that, you can actually fly on a 36 inch diameter weather balloon. I mean, not weather balloon, party balloon. One of these happy birthday balloons. The silver one seemed to work the best. Uh, although I've heard that if you remove the aluminum coating, they actually work better. And there's a couple different ways of doing that. You either rub it with a sponge with some laundry detergent, or you can uh, dip it in sodium hydroxide. That sounds seems more brutal to me, but uh, <laughs> apparently you actually, I would thought the heat would reflect off of a uh, aluminumized coating, but it actually causes more thermal fluctuations, which we're right at the hairy edges of super pressure you have to inflate it with a positive lift less than the weight of a nickel. Anybody know how much a nickel weighs in grams? Five grams. Exactly five grams. How about a penny? Three. You're close. Two and a half. Two and a half, Two and a half grams is the weight of one penny. And uh, they're very accurate. <coughs> so um, if you inflate your uh, party balloon with your payload below it and you put one penny on it, and it's neutrally buoyant, you're good to go. Now, if you go to the weight of a nickel, it will likely pop. So it's a very narrow range. You have to be very precise. I have a little digital scale. I bought six of them from Amazon, 100 gram, 200 gram scales. They're very accurate and they're very nice, and they only weigh cost about $9. But since I bought six of them, I'm probably on a uh, on a meth or a drug. <laughs> 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 uh, so I'm going to show you uh, what's involved in designing one of these uh, micro miniature payloads. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm not the only one doing this. Uh, I actually came in a little late in the game. Uh, but several people have been designing micro miniature uh, payloads. Uh, 
Up on the left is an earlier version of KT5TK's Pecan Pico. And Pecan, he's from North Texas. He's over, currently over in Germany right now. That's Thomas, Thomas Cram. Actually, he was in the, I'm sorry, he's down in the Houston area. And uh, he's been flying several of these. In fact, AB5SS, John, are you around? He has the latest version of the Pecan Pico, which is just about the size of a postage stamp, complete with GPS and transmitter. Um, then we've got uh, Alan, W7QO, has got a, a peach tracker. He's been flying several loads that uh, one just made it uh, three quarters of the way around the world to the Pacific Ocean. And we have Mike, KD2EAT, and he can show you his latest creation. He just designed it and flew it just a few days ago uh, on HF Whisper mode. And uh, he can uh, show people what he's come up with. Um, and then we've got Leo and 0 xcr He came up with a transmitter that he sent around the world on uh, basically a more a little larger custom envelope that he made out of a special plastic material. These are all super pressure balloons. They will go up to altitude and they'll generate pressure inside until the pressure inside is equal to the ambient pressure and they will float for days and possibly months. Leo sent one up. Uh, he had about uh, 10 grams for his payload and uh, his balloon was probably about two and a half by four or five feet long out of the special uh, material. And it uh, went around the world 10 times and stayed aloft four months at an altitude of about 30 to 40,000 feet. Uh, Andy, VK3YT, has been launching these from Australia. And he usually puts them on HF bands, so he uses Whisper Mode or JT9. And uh, those are both extremely weak signal modes. You can get copy down to minus 30 dB below the noise level, which makes a low power 10 to 20 milliwatt HF transmitter useful or worldwide. Uh, he, sent, he has sent some completely around the world, even on a party balloon, one of those 36 inch party balloons. He sent one that stayed aloft for five weeks went from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere, actually went across the Gulf of Mexico, and ended up a couple of days from going completely around the world and got knocked down by a storm in the Indian Ocean. But it transversed to the north and back again to the south. So, uh, and then uh, down below we've got some, uh, the SB9 UOB on the right, he's from Poland. Uh, his latest version, I think, is about six grams with the with the solar cell, and I believe that's uh, uh, no, that's UB Sets down the middle, the University of Bristol uh, students for education and development of space, and they have sent a balloon completely around the world. Uh, they did a custom plastic balloon. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I decided to join the game, but uh, most of these other people are use technique that you have to use a reflow oven or a toaster oven, uh, put on a layer of solder paste through a stencil, and I wanted to make a board that was hand solderable. Now, on my old tired eyes, I still have to use a big magnifying glass and a steady hand with a fine tip soldering iron, but everything on this board can be hand soldered. So uh, that was what I came up with. I call it the Sky Tracker. Uh, next slide. I get my boards from Hackvana. And hackvana.org is a great place to work with. Uh, he's from Australia, but he lives in China, right across from a PC board manufacturing company. And I tried to get this board from an American company, which I normally work with. It has been mentioned here today. But they only do it in 0.062 inch thick boards. Now, when I asked them if I could get it in a thinner board, I said, well, yeah, we could do it, but it'll be $37 a board in small quantities. They have a deal for $33 a board 
in normal thickness, but the half thickness, they'd have to charge me more. So I did it out of this ration. I got four boards for $37 a piece. Then I went to Hackvana and says, I want these thin boards of 0.031 inch thick, 31 miles. They said, oh, no, no notes to charge. How much are they? Three dollars a board. <laughs> and they're pretty quick. Um, actually, I pay as much for shipping as I do for the boards. So with shipping, $60 gets me 10 boards. And they're very high quality. I get them within two weeks. And they can even make them thinner than half thickness boards. They can make them clear down to uh, 20 mils, I think, 24 mils. Uh, by getting a thick, thinner board, you are making the boards half as light. And when you're dealing with Pico Balloon micro miniature payloads, uh, basically I've been told you make it as light as humanly possible and then you add more lightness. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what you really have to do. You have to, you have to weigh every component on that mess scale. You have to <laughs> measure everything to the fraction of a gram and just try and cut weight wherever possible. So my final payload is about 14 grams, which is a half an ounce. And uh, this is the uh, solar powered only version. And uh, there's two uh, power film solar thin film panels. They're about a dollar a piece. <laughs> And I could get the space qualified ones that are 28%, but they would cost $1,000 a piece. <laughs> and uh, I, I think the price difference for a 10% sell is, is probably worth it. I've got more than enough power to power this board, because my average current drain is about 30 to 35 milliamps. Um, I turn the GPS off when I transmit. It puts out 20 milliwatts on APRS. Now you think, well, that's not very much power. Everybody's running a half a watt. Some people have been running 10 watts on balloons. Uh, well, that's way overkill. The 300 milliwatts that everybody's been running thinking, well, that's not enough power. That's barely enough power. I ran this around town in the car, running 20 milliwatts to my whip and 10 in the car, and I got all kinds of reports. And that's the beauty of APRS, because you have a half second transmission, and even though you're competing with 50 watt transmitters, 20 milliwatts will get through, particularly when it's up in the air. Somebody's going to hear it. And I have actually used these as the primary tracker on a regular latex balloon without, without the solar panels. In fact, uh, I have one right here. And uh, with my uh, exclusive uh, bubble wrap technique, <laughs> actually this time I didn't use foam cord, I just wrapped it in bubble wrap. Uh, that's one of those sky traffic boards without the uh, solar panels. I don't know if you can see it in there. I have a little four gram lithium polymer uh, uh, battery on the back. And uh, that's enough for about four or five hours of flight time. And the, about three layers of bubble wrap uh, gives me enough uh, cushion to keep it above about minus 30. If you go below minus 30, LiPo batteries just don't like that. And in fact, this one, uh, it tore this, the tape went let loose and it actually cooled down to about minus 40 during the descent and it actually died for a while because the battery froze. But when it hit about 20,000 feet, it came back on. But I just believe this uh, last, uh, last weekend, the uh, balloon workshop we held in Huntsville, Alabama, and that was the primary tracker. And it worked great. Went up to 113,000 feet. So uh, this whole payload, as a primary tracker, what's your average weight, do you think, for an APRS tracker, most people? Most, most groups, just throw out a number. What is your average weight? About three pounds. About three pound pounds? And pound and a half? Two ounces. <laughs> <laughs> most of which is in duct tape and bubble wrap. And heavy rope. The tracker itself weighs six grams. Uh, actually, it's 10 grams with the battery. Because uh, the solar panels weigh about four grams. So uh, I also have an, uh, okay, next slide. I designed the board in uh, Eagle, uh, although there are a couple other people have been using Dip Trace, and there's actually a free one called Design Spark, which uh, RS Electronics uh, offers as a free download, and there's no limit, and it's a very nice program. 
Free PCB is another one. Yes. Free, free PCB is another one. But does that one uh, require you to use their website? Uh, their no, no. This is this will create the uh, Gerber files. Oh, okay. That'd be great because Express PCB or one of them, they block you That's in. Right. Yeah, free PCB is free, and it's a Gerber file that anybody can shoot. I have my oh. shot in China. So. Okay, great, great. Uh, that's the LiPo battery. I got those in China for a couple of bucks a piece. However, uh, when you buy stuff from China, uh, you have to be aware of quality assurance issues. Uh, some of you have noticed the variances in the Huawei. I'm going to call them Huawei's for H-W-O-Y-E-E. -E. Uh, anyways, their balloons have a great deal of variance. Sometimes they work better than any balloon out there, and they go to incredible heights. And then uh, last year at GPSL, we flew three of them. They popped, and they should have gone to over 110,000 feet. Oh. All of the, I bought a batch of them. Uh -huh. I'm not getting better than 65,000. Right, and that was a 1,600 gram balloon. 1,200. Oh, 1,200. But that should have gone up at least 100,000. At least 85,000. Right. So uh, their, their batches vary dramatically from batch to batch. But what I found is, in the in the 20 batteries I bought, uh, the ones that had printing that you could read were great. The ones that had really weak printing that you could barely read the print on it, they didn't work at all. So I think I got a box of leftovers from the factory floor. <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh, there's the, uh, I put super caps on the back, and uh, that basically, let me pull this out so I can show the super caps. The super caps allow you to survive brief outages on the solar panel, be it from uh, the balloon itself shadowing one of the panels or a quick cloud. Uh, they even things out so the board isn't constantly resetting. Uh, but there's a weight penalty. I've got about three grams worth of super caps on there, which is half again of the weight of the whole board to begin with. Uh, I actually am using a little smaller super caps than uh, Mike and uh, Alan have been using uh, because they, they plan to go through a whole two minute cycle with the super caps if you're blocked. And I just use it to prevent a glitch, so I'm only running a half a farad compliant on that, which saved me about a gram and a half because I think these weigh about two and a half grams for the two little super caps. This is an HF version. This is a whisper on 20 meters, 20 milliwatts. And I have a, uh, that SMA connector is just for testing. Uh, that comes off and I put uh, 36 gauge magnet wire dipole on it. I twist it with uh, a fishing line, 20 to 30 pound fishing line, that spectra fiber. Uh, it's not your, you know, it's the braided stuff that's real tough. It's got kind of a wax coating in it too. But you mix that, twist that with the, the magnet wire, and it makes it very strong. Magnet wire will just snap if you look at it. It's about the strength of a human hair, so you couldn't possibly lift this up just with magnet wire on it, supporting everything. So uh, I've got an HF dipole that's 34 feet long, 17 feet on the side, fed in the center, uh, that weighs 3 grams. <laughs> And add that to the way the board. So my HF payload is right around 16, 17, 18 grams or so. Bill, does the uh, have trouble picturing the dipole just hang down like 17 a feet up on the vertical support line to the balloon and 17 feet down dangling. And so it goes up this way. This actually is the HF version. Uh, the One of the panels is a little bent. And that's because during my last flight with a $134 balloon, uh, Scientific Balloon Solutions, which is Ron K6 RPT's uh, new company, is now selling uh, super pressure balloons to get you up higher above the storms. The problem with flying a mylar party balloon is you are at risk at the, they fly about 7,500 to 9,000 meters, which is about 21 to 27,000 feet or so, up to 30 some thousand. A lot of storms in that area. And it's just the luck of the draw how long you're going to go before a storm will all, all want to get it. <laughs> but the balloon costs $3 and it takes a cubic foot of, of gas.
so you can actually get one of those party balloon tanks from Walmart, and which costs 20 bucks, and you can get like three balloon flights out of that little tank and carry it anywhere you want. But this one, uh, I decided to fly that in one of those new balloons that cost $134 because they'll float at 42,000 feet above 95% of the uh, of the thunderstorms. It can still be knocked down, but it's much much rarer at that altitude to get knocked down. It has to be a really big storm, and so you're likely to stay up for a couple of weeks, go around the world a couple of times with that big balloon. However, I uh, launched it and a wind kicked up right as I was launching it, and it went the opposite direction from what the grass was telling me and my little flag told me on the ground, and it went up over the barn, hit the barn. <laughs> I ran to grab the bottom of the dike pole as it was sliding up the barn, and I just jumped and I missed it by six inches. So I went up, slid along the barn, and landed in my cedar tree. 60 feet up. The payload itself was right at the top of the cedar tree. <laughs> and the balloon was bouncing around 60, uh, 34, uh, 17 feet above it. And I have now a perfect test platform to test my whisper transmitter high above the ground. <laughs> and it stayed that way for a week because it's solar powered, so every day it would come on. And I'd hear this 20 over 9 signal. And I got reports from all over the country. <laughs> it even rained on me. It was still fun. So I enlisted my one of my balloon chasers, uh, Shane and for XWC. And he loves to climb trees. You want somebody like that in a balloon group. Somebody who loves to climb trees. He's got all the equipment. He does search and rescue. And so he shinned up the cedar tree all the way to the top and pulled it down. So I got it back, but it bent the solar panel a little bit. So I'm going to fly this one again, probably in about a week. And this is on HF. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here's the HF one. I used, uh, by the way, I, I use these power film solar panels uh, because they're very easy to solder to, and they take a lot of abuse. Obviously, it banged around the tree, and it was dragged down through a tree. And it's out of the week, and they're still great. Whereas uh, those monocrystalline cells, uh, if you don't put a backing on them, they'll, they're about the uh, strength of, a, of sand. They'll crack right just by looking at them. They're more efficient, and they're probably, you know, they may be a little bit lighter. But that's why I opted for these. All right, next slide. Uh, Based to have a barn, and here we are launching one of the 36-inch uh, balloons. Uh, next slide. That's all you do. Just go out in the yard and toss it up in the air. Next slide. Is that your cedar tree? Uh, no. <laughs> it was much higher than that one. Uh, that, and you can do a one-hand launch. These are great for doing school presentations uh, without having to lug a huge tank of helium around with you. Uh, and a big, huge balloon. You can do it on the cheap. Well, the tracker costs money, but uh, <coughs> the three dollar balloon. And the, they can monitor on their smart smartphones for days on end and see where it goes. Um, next slide. You do have to watch out for power lines. <laughs> I did actually hit a power line with one, and it stayed there for about two minutes before it let go. So I had a little brief uh, uh, interlude of testing. <laughs> Uh, the scent rate's about a meter per second, about 200 feet per minute. So it's very slow scent rate. Uh, how far can they go? Well, that one you just saw I launched. Uh, spent three days to go to, to Newfoundland. And uh, 33 hours later, it showed up in France, taking the same amount of time to cross the Atlantic as Lindbergh. It spent three days in Europe, floating along at about 27,000 feet, and went across Italy and Poland, and ended up off the coast of Sweden, between Sweden and Finland, and a storm, a snowstorm got up. And it slowly came down. You watch it coming in. And I got data clear down to 3,000 feet before it splashed into the Baltic Sea. But that's six days. Now here's a neat thing you can do uh, with uh, Google Maps uh, from APRS. You can slide the street view 
onto your balloon icon, and you can see what's going on below your balloon. So I got a, I got a road tour of Europe guided by my balloon. Uh, Whisper Balloons, uh, that's the free program, WSPR, and you can download it from K1JT's website. Just search for Whisper, WSPR, and uh, it's a free download. It uh, receives it off 20 meters, it's a two minute transmission, and it uploads it to the WhisperNet database. Uh, next slide. This is the map that you get from Whisper, and it has a database where you can get the data. And however, it's a four digit grid square, so we had to come up with a system to encode telemetry by sending a second call sign that is an invalid call sign, but it comes on the same frequency right after our, our first transmission. And we encode telemetry into the call sign and the power field, which gives us a six digit grid square, battery voltage, temperature, and 30, uh, 60 meter mm -hmm. altitude increments. And this is anywhere in the world. I actually see that Australian station there. This is a flight of mine that ended up halfway across the Atlantic and halfway around the world in Australia, they picked up both transmissions on 20 milliwatts on each end. <laughs> Next slide. And by the way, you can uh, pick up Bill here in Texas real nice when he's on the ground. Yes, yeah, I t I've been testing a lot and you guys pick it up over here in Texas. Uh, this is a, a, a portrait break D station and you can see my call sign and the telemetry call sign on top of each other. Uh, next slide. Uh, the nice thing is, this shows up on APRSFI because I've developed a Python script that grabs the data from WhisperNet and converts it to an APRS format and sends it to the server. And so every 10 minutes you get an APRS uh, plot which also shows up on the havehub.org uh, site because it picks up balloon flights off of APRS.FI. Uh, so I'm getting APRS data, what appears to be APRS data from the middle of the Atlantic. A lot of people ask, how did you do that? And uh, Michael's got a, uh, a system to do that. Uh, do you use Python or Perl to do uh, Alan and I both use Perl. Okay. And, they, uh, yeah, we're just modifying it now. We'll listen. Uh, my next track is going to be in on 20 and 30 meters, ultimately, okay. uh, based on data conditions. And then we'll hear tracks from either side and inject it. And his uh, latest flight just launched uh, this week and it <coughs> splashed down when it hit a storm off of Newfoundland. Uh, next slide. That's the storm that got that particular flight. <laughs> it, uh, it hit it and it was gone. Uh, but that was on a 36 inch part of it. Next slide. Uh, this is the SPS 13 envelope. It's three and a half feet, uh, three feet by seven and a half feet. And they cost $134. They're very nicely made. The material is sushi wrap, but you had to buy a 10,000 foot roll of it, <laughs> which, which apparently they did. So now they're producing this for the high altitude balloon community for the Pico Sac community. Uh, nice thing is, you get above the storms. So that's the real nice thing about it, but you're spending a little bit more money. But they're pretty easy to inflate and launch. Next slide. My first flight with one of theirs ended up in Morocco. Actually, it was heard in Qatar, but the guy didn't have his APRS set up, and that's a whole region of the world where there's very little APRS activity. But it was heard in Qatar, which is right next to Saudi Arabia. Uh, next slide. This is uh, Leo's flight that went around the world ten times. Uh, next slide. Uh, that we launch at the Dayton Hambench every year, so I just wanted to show you that launch we did from there. Next slide. We landed near Neil Armstrong's hometown. But we usually get a big crowd that come out and watch. Next slide. And then, of course, GPSO. I advertise that to you. I wanted to also mention, in passing, that uh, this is my Iridium tracker. And I'll pass that around for those who may not have seen it last year. But this sends uh, use of the Iridium system. Uh, Howard flew it uh, last year on his flight, up in our, the Boy Scout flight in Rantoul, Illinois. And it transmits from the ground. It'll be laying flat on the ground and you can still get the final uh, position. And uh, the DeLorme inReach has one of these modems in it, but they have an altitude limit of 29,000 
and 28 feet. And I asked the engineer, why 29,000 and 28 feet? I couldn't figure that out. Well, we didn't think anybody would be hiking above the top of Mount Everest. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to develop my own system using the Iridium, and it's $16 a month for the data, and you get 12K of data, which is enough to do quite a few balloon flights in a month. And it sends a text message, I mean, actually it sends an email to me. And then I parse it and send it to that APRS website. Once again, through a Python script. So, any questions? Yes? I'm curious, if you do the Abrams and the Plum Balloon, how much are you paying for, for flight? Uh, the, come out to for, for it oh, okay, the well, the, the payloads, I'm actually starting to sell these in limited quantities because they take me a long time to build. Uh, but uh, about 129, fully loaded with uh, solar power version, and uh, three dollars for the balloon, and a cubic foot of helium or hydrogen. So, so what's the You probably you're probably around 135 dollars, <laughs> unless you go with that bigger balloon and you've added it'd be about 300. And we'll be launching uh, a series of Pico balloons tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, Mike, uh, KD2EAT, John, AB5SS. We'll be flying, he'll be flying the uh, Peach Tracker, the micro. What is it? Pecan. He's oh, I'm pecan. sorry, Pecan, sorry. And uh, you'll be flying, what do you call yours? The Wisp. The Wisp, okay. That would be used for the rate, unless you use radio chip. Oh, I'm using a Cypress synthesizer. It's the CY22393. I get 20 milliwatts out of it. Uh, most other people are using the Silicon Labs SI5351, but you get about 10 milliwatts out of that. But that's still enough for a whisper. It's probably a little weak for APRS, 20 milliwatts. It likes that 10 to 20. APRS works a little better at 20. Uh, yes? Do you do anything to keep it dry? Anything? No, uh, I could come formal coat it, but that would add some weight. Uh, I figured that if there's enough moisture to damage the transmitter, the balloon's gone its way down anyways, because you collect moisture on that balloon envelope or rain, it's coming down, because you only have a couple of grams of the lift. i got time for one more question. Anybody? Yes? I was just going to ask, why, why is it so important to have be super lightweight? Uh, because the lift of a, a party balloon, if you go, uh, the lighter it is, the higher it's going to fly. Sure. If you put a couple of ounces on it, it would fly at about 3,000 feet and wouldn't stay up very long. Could you not just use multiple party balloons? You could, but it's tough to get them inflated exactly the same. I'm actually doing But that. he's doing that. Yeah, okay. I'm doing two, two party balloons together. And he takes them vertically with high vector. So, uh, but to uh, check with John and Mike and myself and see all the picos, because uh, we'll have three of them going up, three different uh, styles. Well, right. th thank you very much as always. Amazing thing to be here. Okay, uh, Nick.